Thank you for joining us for another power-packed message from Dr. Miles Monroe, provided by Monroe Global Incorporated and MonroeGlobal.com. We transform followers into leaders and leaders into agents of change. We hope that this message is a blessing to you as you advance your life and discover your purpose. Now, let's go into the message. So I'm going to talk to you about remembering him. And notice the way I have written it. Jesus used this term at this meal. He said, remember me. But he didn't just use it at the meal. He also used it during the last moments of his life on the cross. We will talk about that because it was a very important statement. First of all, I want to remind you of the scriptures and how important this supper is. This, this supper that Jesus ate was the fulfillment of a prophetic, long-running contract that God had with us. And it goes all the way back to the Old Testament. Jesus actually told them, I was waiting to eat this Passover with you. The Passover was celebrated every single year in Israel. It was celebrated for over 4,000 years. That's how old the Passover celebration is. And you can see what the word means in Hebrew. It's Paschal or the Yiddish meal. This meal that Jesus celebrated, we call it Passover, Paschal, Yiddish, it means he passed over. And it goes all the way back to the book of Exodus. You remember when Moses went to Pharaoh and demanded that Pharaoh let the people go. Thus, seven times Moses tried to convince Pharaoh and Pharaoh resisted. And so God told Moses, go back to Pharaoh And tell him, this is the last warning. But this time, if he doesn't obey me and let the people go, I will no longer put blood in the water. I will no longer send locusts to eat the crops. I will no longer send flies to infest the entire country. But this time, I am going to send the death angel. And the death angel will come and bring death to every firstborn in the house of every Egyptian, including Pharaoh's son. So Moses went to Pharaoh with that message. Then God said to Moses, uh, The Israelites are in the land living among the Egyptians. I want you to send a message to every one of them and tell every community what they must do. Each one must take a lamb and they must kill it. They must let the blood drain out of it. They must put it in a bowl and they must take a branch of hyssop and dip it in the blood and they must put the blood on the four posts of the door and make sure the blood covers both sides and the top he said they must do this because if they don't do this when the death angel comes 
to destroy all the firstborn of Egypt. If there's no blood over your door, your son shall also die. And so Moses went and gave the instructions to the people, and the people obeyed him. And then suddenly it became dark. And the Bible says there was a loud sound in the air, and the death angel began to move across the land of Egypt. And there was screaming and wailing all through the settlements, all over the neighborhood. People were weeping and screaming as young boys and teenagers were dying. And when the angel passed over every house, there was a dead body in the house. But what was unique is that when the angel came to a house where he saw blood, Instead of going to that house to kill the firstborn, he passed over the house and went to the next house where there is no blood. And over a million houses, the angel didn't touch. But every other house was full of death. And during that night, Pharaoh's son was killed. And Pharaoh cried out and demanded Moses to come. Moses went to see him. And Pharaoh said to him, It is because of you there's death in my land. Take your people and get out now, it was late in the night. They were in their houses, locked up with blood all over the door. And they were just about to have their evening meal. The bread was still being made. The onions and the garlic was still being prepared for the meal. They didn't finish cooking yet. And Pharaoh said, I will not wait until morning. Get your people out of Egypt now. And they sounded a trumpet, and Moses sent the message through the community, and he told them, take what you could carry and run. And the people had to move so quickly that they grabbed the unfinished meal, the chopped up onions, the crushed garlic, the unleavened bread that had not risen yet. They grabbed the spices and they dumped them in their bags, threw them over their shoulders and children and old people and young people and adults ran from the houses toward Moses and they ran out toward the desert. And in the morning, they were all gone. And there was weeping and gnashing of teeth in Egypt. And there was death everywhere. The place was stink with dead bodies. And the children of Israel were delivered that night. God also made the Egyptians give them money and animals. They gave them jewels and trinkets just to get rid of them. And they left. Seven days later, the Lord told Moses, gather the people. I want to remind them of what happened a few days ago. The Lord says, from now on until forever, you will celebrate what happened tonight. And it shall be called Pascal. He passed over. We call it.
the Passover celebration. Still today in Israel, they celebrate once a year the Passover. Every generation of Israel celebrated that meal for 4,000 years. When they celebrate the meal, they celebrate the meal in an interesting way. I want you to remember this. First of all, they use unleavened bread. Can you tell me why? Because they had to remind themselves of everything that happened that night. So they used the same type of bread to celebrate the feast. They had to use bread without leaven. They also use bitter herbs. The bread they use is called matzo today. Unleavened bread. And they call it the seder. The seder is the order in which each part of the meal is served. Because each part of the meal on the table represented something that was redemption. The unleavened bread, for example, leaven in the Bible means two things. It actually means sin, but it also means life. Interesting. The body without leaven represented a human without sin. The crushed up onions and garlic and bitter herbs were terrible. You don't eat them without cooking them. And they put them on the table at every Passover and they ate raw garlic. They ate onions. They ate the bitter herbs to remind them of the hardship in slavery. And every year they reminded themselves of the Passover. There's an old song that you learn growing up, I think, that says, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Tonight, sitting in this auditorium and the thousands watching us around the world, I have a question to ask you. Is there blood on your life? Because where there is no blood, there's no remission of sin. Now, we all know that everything that God does, the Bible says, portrayed the forthcoming of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And on that table, and the Bible talks about this, that when they ran, they also took some items that I put up here. Some of them you don't understand because they actually have to do with bitter herbs. But you notice there's an egg. They always use a boiled egg on Passover because our egg represents new life. And out of all the bitterness, you will also experience new life. And that meal was very meticulously prepared every year. Now I need to tell you something that's very important. In the middle of the table you see here in the front of Jesus is a silver cup. The silver cup is turned upside down. God commanded Moses that they must also place upon the table a cup that no one is to use whenever they had the meal. Can you imagine 
Every time those families got together, once a year, at the great day of atonement, when they took the lamb and cut the lamb, and they took the blood into the holies of holies, and the priests went in to offer the blood of the lamb for the sins of the people so that the death could pass over them, they killed the lamb every Passover. So Passover is the same day as the day of atonement. It's the day when they kill the lamb to atone for the sins of the people for 4,000 years. They had to keep killing lambs. As a matter of fact, you may not be aware of this, but on the day of atonement, if you went and everybody had to go down to Jerusalem, everybody went, sometime over 500,000 people were gathered around that temple in Jerusalem every year after Solomon built that temple. But they used to gather in the desert. Could you imagine half a million people trying to get into a building? And the priests would tell everyone, you must bring an animal to cover your family. Okay. So we got 500 families, 500,000 families, 500,000 families. Are you watching this? Each one have to bring a sheep or a goat or a pigeon or a dove. And they had to bring it to the temple. Could you imagine in one day killing 500,000 sheep or goats? You wouldn't want to be near that temple that day. There was blood all over the terrace. Millions of tons of blood. And it had to be spilled. And each one had to bring their own animal, the head of the home, to cover his family. And they came from Africa. They were spread out, out in the far east. They came from the north. They came from Italy. They were all over. And they all came toward the temple in Jerusalem. And each one had to bring their animals. Could you imagine they had to walk? Imagine walking from Syria to Jerusalem. That's almost two months of walking. To walk from northern Africa and Ethiopia all the way to the temple would take sometimes six months journey. And they had to bring their animals. And it got so challenging that some of those families were so poor, they couldn't afford to bring their animals. So they decided that they would just go to Jerusalem, and when they get there, they will buy an animal. So some of the priests saw this as big business. Because they knew that once you walk for five months and you are in Jerusalem and you ain't got no animal, your sins won't be forgiven. So they started selling animals in the temple courtyard. And therefore, can you imagine that your sin will not be forgiven if you don't have an animal for your wife and your five children, and the only way to get an animal is to buy it from me, which means I could charge you any price. And so developed a racket in the temple. Secondly, if you came from different provinces with different economic pieces of money and you traveled to Jerusalem, you had to change the money to buy the animal because they wouldn't take your money. So there were those who were in the temple courtyard who were like the bankers. You go to them, it's like a cambio. You know what a cambio is? You go to them and you change your money, then you take your money and buy the animal. So the guys who were changing your money, <laughs> they would charge you for changing it. So you were hit twice with VAT. They overcharge you for changing the money and they overcharge you for the animal and you had to buy it. That's why the poor people were abused. Now you understand that day 
when Jesus walked into the temple and he saw those tired poor people who walked for months with their children trailing behind them and their wives pregnant and they are staggering and these mean priests would say to them that's the price take it or leave it and that's when Jesus cried out my father's house is not a house of merchandising and he platted a whip and he drove out the merchants, priests. He turned their tables upside down. He opened all the animal cages and the poor people had free animals. Give God a praise that the king of kings will provide you for the lamb. But Moses commanded them to also put a cup on every table. And for over 4,000 years, the Israelites got together in their homes privately. And this supper was always private. It was not public. It was held in the house. I hope that we will go back to that. Communion was never to be held in a church service. It was to be held in your home. And every Passover, Jesus as a boy celebrated that meal. I want you to think for a minute that Jesus is sitting with his father and his mother, his sisters and brothers. He had many of them, the Bible says. And they would sit there and they would go through the whole experience. They would eat the bitter herbs. They would eat the figs. They would eat the dates. They would eat the garlic. <clears throat> they would eat the raw onions. Yuck. And he was sitting there as a teenager knowing and this whole table was for him. I believe every day, every Passover day, he would sit there and watch his father place the cup on the table and no one's supposed to touch it. And then as a kid, he would look at that cup because he knew that's mine. Let me explain the cup to you. Because it's important to understand the power of redemption. Moses told them, place a cup on the table and no one is to drink out of it. For the day when the Messiah arrives, only he will pick up the cup. So everybody was afraid to touch the cup. When the meal was over, the father would take the cup very carefully, wrap it in white linen, put it in a box, and they would hide it away until the next 12 months. And they did that for 4,000 years. And for 30 years, Jesus did it and never touched it. And now he's 33 years old. And here's what happened. Luke chapter 22, verse 7. Then came the day of unleavened bread. Now you understand unleavened now, right? Hello? Unleavened means what? This is Passover. They call it the day of unleavened bread. They call it the day of passing over the day. They call it Pascal, the day of the lamb. They call it Pascal, the day of the blood. Different names. The day of unleavened bread and Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. And Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and make preparation for us to eat the Passover. He knows that on this day, we 
will be the last time he would eat it. Because this is the day he has to pick up the cup. Are you following me? Read the next verse. Peter asks, where do you want us to prepare it? And Jesus answered, as you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters. Notice a house, not a temple, not a synagogue. And say to the owner of that house, the teacher asks, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And then he will show you a large upper room, all furnished. Make preparation there. So they left and they found things just as Jesus had told them. And so they were prepared the Passover for the last three weeks I have been waiting for this night I feel the same way Jesus felt I was waiting to have this meal with you so be prepared Jesus is with us tonight and he has prepared this meal for you I want you to read the next verse. When the hour came, Jesus and his disciples did what? I can't hear you. I can't hear you. That word is important. They reclined at the table. In the day of Jesus, and even still today in the Middle East, they don't sit in chairs to eat. Do you understand? They sit on the floor. They actually lie down like these men are lying down. That's the way they ate. They ate on the floor. That word is important. To recline means to lie down. And the way they lie down is the way this gentleman is lying down. They would put their feet behind them and they would prop themselves up on their elbows and then they would eat with one hand and the meal was not served in plates for each person that still happens today they had what they call common dishes for example all the bread would be in one big plate all the vegetables would be in one big plate all the meat would be in one big plate all the soup would be in one big plate so everybody ate from the same plates. So when they reached to get a piece of meat, you could have seven hands in the same bowl. Now you understand when Jesus was sitting, with, lying with them like this, and Jesus suddenly said, one of you will betray me. And they were lying just like this. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about the seating. Uh, this is John. You see how John is lying? When Jesus began to teach very often at this supper, John would actually lay down like this on his bosom. Now some of you read in the Bible where it says that the one who lie on his bosom, that's how he was able to do it. He was always the one who wants to sit right next to Jesus. So John, the beloved, they called him, he loved this spot right here. This is John's spot on the right hand of Jesus to lie on his breast. Got it now? That's why it was possible. On his left would be the person who is the treasurer. 
The reason why the treasurer normally sit near the honored guest is because he would have to give a report. So this is Judas right here. Everybody say, Lord have mercy. So where do you think Peter would be sitting? Can you tell me? Peter would be sitting at the far end. Why would he sit at the far end? Because the person who will be responsible for protecting the honored host would sit nearest the door. The one who's closest to defend if anything happens. So Peter would be sitting away from Jesus, not near him. And Peter was the one who was responsible for, for, for setting up the meal. So he is now serving as the chief host. So he would sit at the end to protect Jesus. You remember throughout Peter's life, he had this spirit of protection for Jesus. Remember that? Matter of fact, it was him who pulled out the sword when they were going to attack Jesus. And he just swung at the guy's neck and he missed and got his air. Peter was the defender of the group. He's the one that carried the sword. He would never sit near Jesus. He would be sitting there to protect him from the door. Clear? Now you can see why when Jesus said, someone will betray me, the first one to answer was John. Why? He's the nearest and he's close. And he said, is it I, Lord? And of course, Peter probably spoke up next. Amy. And Jesus said, whoever hand is in the same bowl with me now, it is he who shall betray me. And guess whose hand was in the nearest bowl? Judas. Isn't that simple? Then Jesus turned to Judas and said, go. Whatever you plan to do, do it quickly. I want you to read what happens next. They reclined at the table and he said to them, I have waited for 4,000 years. Can I put it that way? To eat this Passover. Notice the word this. I've eaten 33 of them with you. But this one, You've eaten 4,000 years worth. But this is the last one you have to eat. Uh, by the way, uh, let me explain something else to you. Uh, you notice how these men are sitting. You see their feet all over the place? In the days of Jesus, 2,000 years ago, they didn't have streets that were paved like ours. All the streets were just dust and quarry. So when they went to a meal to anyone's house, they would walk from one village to another and their feet would be filled with dust. Their sandals would turn white with dust. Even today, when you go to Israel with me and you walk the streets, the old streets, your tennis changes color, even today. Imagine you had these big hairy feet in these leather sandals walking from one village to another to have a meal with a family like this and you when you arrive you had bathed and changed your clothing right to go to the meal so your clothes is clean your body is clean but your feet are filthy so every home in the day of Jesus had what they call a door servant his job was to wash the dust of every guest's feet before they went in. You can see why. You don't want nobody with stink toe jam, toe jam, and dust and mud near your food. So it was required that they wash their feet. Everybody had to do it. So at every door, there was a little closet built with a basin and a bucket. All houses had that. 
And when you went to eat with that family, they would require that you get your feet washed. So the servant would be there waiting for the guests and he would wash their feet and then they can go in. You remember when there was a Passover feast and Jesus sent them to a place to celebrate the same meal. And when they got there, there was no servant. What did they do? They stayed outside, grumbling. Where's this servant? He must be from the Bahamas. We out here, we supposed to eat this meal, the sun's setting, we gotta get in there, the Sabbath almost there. We need to get it, and they complain, what's wrong with these people? They're so lazy, they don't want work. You know, and they, they, they're upset. Then Jesus arrives, and he asks them, what are you doing outside here? I told you to prepare a meal. And they said, there is no servant to wash our feet. And Jesus looked at them, and then he walked over to the little closet. He opened the door, he picked up the basin and the bucket. He walks all the way down to the well himself, drops the bucket in the well, and they are watching him go, and he brings the water back, and he sits on the servant's stool, and he says, line up. They were embarrassed. He said, come, come, come. Put your foot in here. And embarrassed, they put their feet and he washed it. And Peter was so embarrassed. Because he's the one with the big mouth all the time. About how much he loved Jesus. Now he is so embarrassed, he tells Jesus when he comes... You know, he's the last one. He kept going in the back, going in the back, until it was only him left. And he comes up and he said, Lord, you don't need to wash my feet. Now follow me carefully, because I'm going to show you how stupid you can be in theology. Peter says, Lord, you don't need to wash my feet. And Jesus looked at Peter and says, let me tell you something, Peter. If you don't allow me to wash your feet, you have no part in this meal. That was a statement of hygiene, not revelation. He was not instituting a foot washing service. Oh boy, now you see. Now my daddy's a Baptist pastor. I was brought up in a Baptist church. And believe me, when they had foot washing service, I tell daddy, I didn't want to go to church. Because I see them rusty feet with all them corn and them toenail to go in left, right, and center. I said, I ain't touching them dirty feet. Ain't nobody going to get me to wash them smelly feet. Anybody with me say it, amen. Yeah. That was never his intention to make it a ritual. He simply told Peter, if you don't get your feet washed, you don't eat with us. He was teaching a deeper lesson. Here's the lesson. The lesson was a lesson of leadership. And the lesson was, when you arrive anywhere and something needs to be done, you take the initiative. Be willing to do whatever is necessary, including giving up your title for a few minutes. To get things done. Give God a hand for a deep lesson. How many times have you heard somebody say, I know maintenance person. See this dirt on the floor and this bottom, this tissue paper. Call the maintenance man. You got a demon. If you go to the bathroom in this church and there's a paper on the floor, don't call the maintenance people. Become one. It's called the spirit of leadership. And so, that's why they had to wash their feet. Now, Jesus said, I eagerly waited to eat this one. I think they were a little confused. You know, let me tell you something. These disciples were just like me and you. They, they were attracted to Jesus because of the miracles. You know, he caught fish for them. You know, he healed Peter's mother-in-law. 
you know, he multiplied fish and bread for thousands of people. They saw him heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out a demon, walk on the water. And so they're like, you know, boy, I think you might be God. I think you might be the disciple. I mean, the Messiah. But some of them still wasn't sure. You could tell by the question he asked them before he went to the, to the meal. The last question he asked them before he went to the meal was, who do men say that I am? And their answers were wrong. Some say you are a prophet. Some say you are Elijah. Some say you are uh, John the Baptist. They, were, they didn't even know. They weren't sure. Still. Listen to me carefully. That's why he said, I was eager. I couldn't wait to eat this meal with you. Because I'm about to take every doubt out of your head. How's he going to do it? He says, I wanted to eat this particular Passover with you before I suffer. What are you talking about? I'm about to suffer, he says. Why? Jesus Christ is both the high priest and the lamb. Oh, you don't get that. See, the high priest took the lamb. Kill it. Catch the blood from the jugular vein in a bowl. Walked into the holies of holies with a piece of rope around his leg. Every priest had to tie a rope around his right leg. And he would walk into that place where there was no light. The curtains were as thick as five inches. It was black in there. And the only thing in the Holy of Holies was the Ark of the Covenant. And it was black. You couldn't see. And the only way he could walk in there is that when he got in there, he had to feel his way to that Ark of the covenant which is the thing you see in the back there and he had to take the blood and pour it between the two cherubims that you see there now why was the rope tied around his feet mm -hmm. because God told Moses to tell the priest if any priest walks into this holiest place and there's just one tenth of sin in his life he will die immediately. And then they'd pull him out. And they'd say, next. Could you imagine the guys in the line saying, mm, uh, you can go before me. Do you want to go next? <laughs> they didn't volunteer to go in there, believe me. Because there was no way they knew whether they'd come out. And the Bible says hundreds of priests died. They pulled them out and buried them. That's how holy God's presence is. And some of you all walk into his presence chewing gum. No idea about the presence of God and his purity. Some worship leaders are not on the fast. I need to pray for you all. I hope you got high blood pressure or something that you ain't get healed of yet. Don't you tell me you ain't fasting. Because you're supposed to lead people in the presence of God. They pulled out dead bodies. The Bible actually says that when the priest placed the blood in the middle of the cherubim, it says the presence of God came in the middle and lit the whole room. The only light in the room was the presence of God. And the Bible says, and the priest was alone with God. And the priest had to appeal on behalf of the people. Oh, Jehovah God, Yahweh. Please be pleased with the blood. And when the presence arrived, that was a sign that God accepted the blood. And the nation was forgiven only for 12 months. At the end of 12 months, the sins all came back upon the people. And they had to go back again and do it one more time. And they did that for 4,000 years. I don't know if you understand why we worship Jesus and why we praise him and why you have no idea why you even praise him you don't understand what he saved you from it wasn't just sin he saved you from a ritual that would have killed you 
trying to get blood every year. This place would have been a bloody place if the Lamb of God didn't come. You'd be making Long Island very happy. Buying sheep from Long Island. They'd be wealthy if Christ didn't come. Give God a big hand for Jesus. He said, I long to eat this with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again, he says, until it finds fulfillment. And then he hits it on the head. Not in Christianity. Not in a religion. It will be fulfilled in what? See there? The kingdom. That's the message. You know, there are some people who perhaps in our church who have left because they say, you know, I'm tired of my house teaching the kingdom. I don't care what you say. I ain't teaching nothing else. Amen. If you want to get a hoop, 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 this ain't the place to get it. He preached what? The kingdom. Even his last supper was about the kingdom. There is no other gospel. Say amen. amen. If you agree with Jesus, you are right. If you agree with Jesus, you ain't got to worry about opposition. You are right. The next verse is very interesting. Now, by the way, I want to show you this picture. There is a picture there of a reclining table. See how they're sitting on the ground? So this photograph is wrong. It was painted by Leonardo da Vinci. It's wrong. They didn't sit in chairs at a table. That's wrong. This is more correct. So don't buy this one. See how dumb we could be? That's nice. It ain't nice. It's wrong. So the artist needed some education. Read the next verse aloud. Go. After taking the cup. Stop. Notice it didn't say after taking a cup. Now I want you to think about this room for a minute before we pray. These guys, all their lives, they grew up in the synagogues. These are all Jews. Their families celebrated this meal all their lives. They heard about the story about this silver cup. It had to be a silver cup. And their father told them, that cup is in every house. And somewhere in Israel, there might be this particular Passover where somebody in some house picked it up and put wine in it. And for 4,000 years, they never touched the cup. Now, if you read the whole story, which I haven't, from verse 7 all the way down to verse 17, it actually said, after they had supped, what does that mean? They ate, and everybody was finished. So now, what he's about to do is not a part of the meal. Normally, after this, the family would sing a hymn, and then the father would pronounce the blessing, which is the blessing that David pronounced and Solomon pronounced, which is very common in, in, still in Israel. And then the father would go, and he would wrap the cup back up, and the children would be watching him. He would take it and hide it. And now Jesus is about to do something no one has ever done in history. After the meal, he said, we ain't going to sing right now. He took the cup. Now, could you imagine these guys watching him? He gets up and he reaches over. And there's a... <sighs> it's happening in our house. 
He told us that he was this Messiah. He told us that he was God in the flesh. But we had our doubts. No one's supposed to touch that. And Jesus in this village, in this house, reached out and took what? Say it loud. The cup. There are many cups on the table. But he picks up the cup. That's why there was no sound in the room. The Bible never said anyone said anything. These guys are in shock. They are like, you know, everything we ever heard from our father and our mother is happening to us. We are living history. We are living divine revelation. We are living the fulfillment of 4,000 years of promise in our house. And then he took the cup. And then he reached out and took the wine. And he filled it with the wine. They are breathing fast. They're beginning. All their eyes are on the cup. Everybody's looking. And they're sitting there thinking, oh, this is, this is not happening. This is not happening here. We appreciate him healing people and raising the dead. But you don't touch this cup. He's telling us that he is the promised Messiah. He's fulfilling the kingdom. And he lifted up the cup. And he said, take this. I think they were afraid to even touch that cup. But you see, once he touched it, you can touch it. Give God praise. In a few moments, you're going to take the cup. The reason why you can take it is because he took it. He took the cup, lifted it up, and he said, this is the new covenant. Covenant means contract that God makes with you today. Let me come down here because I feel like running. What he's saying is, uh, them folks next door in the temple, everybody bringing lambs. There are thousands of people buying goats and buying chicken and buying doves and buying turtle doves. He said, but you don't need to buy nothing today. Give God a praise. <laughs> Son of I feel like weeping when I think about it. He's telling them, you don't need to buy anything today. This is a new contract. No more lambs. No more goats. No more rams. No more pigeons, no more turtle doves, no more killing animals. This is the new contract. God has made his promise real. He promised that I will send the lamb. I can imagine them looking at each other, wondering, are we living this? They begin to whisper, this is impossible. How do I explain this to my mother? How do I tell my father that he touched a cup that we were never supposed to touch? How do I tell my parents that he actually told us to touch it? He even told us to drink from it. Are we dreaming? He said, this is the new covenant in my blood now. You don't need no more sheep, goats, no more rams, no heifer. He says, what? Divided among yourselves. I feel like praising him. Come on, get the revelation. He's saying this salvation is for everybody here. Give God a hand for salvation. He said, divide it among yourselves. Everybody gets to participate in the blood. The blood is coming not just on you. It's going to be in you. 
give God a holy praise. Hallelujah. Do you know that your body is the tabernacle of the Holy Spirit? When they drank it, their body was smeared with blood. And it wasn't a sheep blood. Tonight, in a few minutes, you're going to drink it again. I promise you, by faith, you're going to be covered and smeared with blood again. And I prophesy that death will not overtake you. Death will not touch you. If your faith is in this blood, it will pass. Give God a hand for the Passover today because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus. He took the cup and he passed it to them. And each one had to drink from it. And he started with Judas. What a man. To know that someone will sell you and you still love him. And they drank. And then he says in verse 18, For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine with you until what? The kingdom of God comes. Now, I think most pastors in religion don't like this verse of scripture. Because they preach that the kingdom is coming later. Look at me. He said, I will not drink this cup with you. Not the supper now, the cup with you. Until what? I can't hear you. Okay. So whenever I drink this cup again, that means what? The kingdom has arrived. Okay. So if you study the resurrection, the Bible says he met with them and he came through the wall. And they were shocked that he walked right through the wall in his new body and they weren't sure who he was and then the bible says he took the cup and he gave them bread and he drank with them what does that mean the kingdom is here And that's why I'm trying to teach to you that the government of God is already here. Not in its fullness, but in you. And you're supposed to influence every piece of this property you are on called earth with the kingdom of God. It's here now. Verse 19. Then he took the bread. Now notice the bread he's taking. It's flat, unleavened, fresh piece of bread. They already ate bread. But this bread is not the bread that they ate. Now, you notice that Jesus lifted up something white. See that tissue paper? Lift it up very slowly. Okay, hold up for a second. Do you know that every time they had the Passover, the Father would take a piece of unleavened bread, this is real, you can look it up on the internet, and he would put it in a white napkin. He would fold it in a very ritual way, in a way that you fold the body when it died. And the father would take this bread, ask any Jew about this, and he would hide it from the children somewhere in the house. Strange ritual. And they did that for 4,000 years. They still do it today in Israel. And when the Passover begins, when it begins, the, the last thing the father would bring to the table, the last thing, would be this napkin with the bread folded up in it in the ritual of folding up a dead body. And he would put it on the table right next to the silver cup. And no one could touch that bread. So when it says he took bread, it's not talking about the rolls they ate. He reached out and took the napkin. Now, see, you can't shout like me because you don't know what I know yet. But I feel like shouting all by myself. Ah! Excuse me. 
See, you don't understand. When Jesus died, the Bible says they wrapped him up in a napkin and hid him away for three days. Glory, hallelujah. And on the third day, he rose from the dead. Now go back and read your Bible. It says, and Jesus folded up the napkin after he rose and left, and there was nothing in the napkin. Somebody shout hallelujah. Tell your neighbor there's not just an empty tomb there's an empty napkin too you ought to shout right there the napkin is empty he is out of the napkin he's not in the napkin the dead rose again that's why he took the napkin and picked up that piece of bread and now he could say this not just a piece of bread. Come on, give God a scream. Ha! Ah, this ain't just a piece of bread. This is the bread that was dead and hidden away. This is my body. Let me tell you something. These disciples were shaking in their sandals. Because they were eating something that their father never allowed them to touch. And he break it. And he said, this is my body, broken for you. And then he gave it to each one. And he said, divide it among yourselves. They began to break the body. And they break it. And they break it until it was all broken up. What do you think your sin did to his body? The Bible says he was so disfigured that he could not be recognized as a human anymore. Some of you all saw the movie, The Passion, hey? Eh? I know how you felt during that time, but let me tell you something. I must give Mel Gibson some credit. He was trying to show you that when it was finished, he didn't even look like a human. And the Bible said it specifically. He was beaten so badly that he did not appear as a human. Totally broken up. That's this meal. But what's so amazing, he says, eat it. I want you to become one with me. Uh, you want to shout with me? Okay. The stuff that was in the napkin was not just unleavened, no sin, bread, but it also had life in it. Uh, no, you don't get what I'm talking about. This, this dead bread had life somewhere in it, so that when you bury it, no, don't shout yet, and then he says, eat it, which means now, this stuff going down in you so when the trump of God shall sound come on give him some praise don't get cute on me he said the stuff that you ate is life itself even though it's death going down in it is life you shall rise from the dead because you have eaten his body you are one with him that's why the Bible says if he died and he rose again you who also die shall also rise again you should give God praise just for a couple of minutes and thank him that because he rose from the dead you too will rise this is the most powerful supper on earth and watch how he closes it he said this is my body given for you and now he uses the word remember me I got a picture of the one that the Jews use this is the Passover Pascal bread no leaven you can actually buy it in the stores, in the kosher stores. 
you should get used to it. Can I recommend to you, like my wife and I did, all during the life of our children, we had our communion at our own table. Some of you wait for the church to do communion. Stop it. I want you to get some wine, some grape juice, and keep it in the house. I want you to get some of this bread, keep it in the house. And every time you finish eating around the table, then take communion. Let your own house become the place of communion. And so he took the cup. And there's the statement. After supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. But the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. Same bowl. Uh, this is a photograph of one of the early silver cups. The cup had to be silver for a reason. Now you finally understand the prayer. He's in the Garden of Eden. He's thinking about that silver cup. So he prays, Matthew 26, 39. Going a little further, he fell to his knees, face to the ground. Because he knew when I leave this place, I'm going to go into that supper and it's over. They're going to break up my body. Take the blood out. So he prayed, my father, is it possible? Not a cup. Can this cup be taken from me? He was talking about the silver cup. Everybody say silver. Silver in the economy of Israel is the commodity for redemption. Let me explain it. The word redeem means to buy something back. What did I say? No. Okay, that's important. The word redeem means to buy back something. Now, you buy something that was yours before. You can't redeem something that wasn't yours. So the fact that God says he wants to redeem you is proof that you used to be his. And in the economy of Israel, you could only redeem something with silver. Not gold, silver. Let's say, for example, uh, if you owed me money and you couldn't pay it, then you'd give me your daughter to work in my house to pay the bill back. And if it's a lot of money, she may work for me for the rest of her life. She becomes a slave. Now, if you, just, if you went ahead and you got some money, you became rich, you can come back to me and say, I want to buy my daughter back. You couldn't take it back. You had to buy her back. To get your daughter back, you couldn't give me a piece of land. You couldn't give me gold, anything. You had to bring silver to me. Are you following me? Now you understand Judas. Judas was trying to sell Jesus, not buy him back. And the priests, without even knowing it, sometimes God will use a fool. Oh, y'all, you don't get the message. The priest decided to pay him in silver. the price of redemption the priest didn't even know that he was trying to buy his own savior 
and he had to use silver. Give God a hand for the wisdom of the Holy Ghost. And Judas held in his hands the price of redemption. He says, not my will, Lord. I'll drink the cup. Thine be done. There's another cup that they found, an old cup. They took a photo of it, silver. This is from a table of a Jew. It's over 3,000 years old. I tell you, this is real. That's the cup they never touched. You know, today, the Jews are still waiting for the Messiah. You knew that, right? That's why they, they're blinded, the Bible says. If you go, if, if you go to their homes during Good Friday, Good Friday is Passover every year in Israel. Because it was on Good Friday, it was the Passover when Jesus himself died. Oh. Oh. He had to die on the Day of Atonement. And by the way, three o'clock is when the priest walked into the temple. Into the Holy of Holies with the... Oh man. You all still don't get it. Read your Bible. The Bible says at three o'clock there was darkness suddenly. And then the veil of the temple holiest of holiest was torn from the top down. It was higher than this roof. No human could tear curtains that are five inches thick. Somebody went and tore it from heaven and exposed the ark. Why? You don't need to come in here anymore. Because opposite is the man on the cross who blood I have accepted at three o'clock. You were redeemed. Give God a hand for three o'clock. He said, I did this for you. Not my will, but thine be done. You should just lift your hands and thank him for not giving up the cup. He drank it. Thank you, Lord. I'm so glad I'm not going to hell. Praise the Lord. I'm so glad I'm going to heaven. I'm so glad that my sins that I was born with have been cleansed. I'm so glad that even the sins I have sinned the last three weeks, months, years are completely under the blood tonight. Even the sins in my mind are covered. You said you sprinkle even our conscience with your blood. Our conscience is clean because give him worship. His blood, come on disciples, worship him. His blood. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. If you died tonight, you'd go straight to your father because of that wonderful blood. Abba, Father, everything is possible can you take this cup from me yet not my will I'll do it for them and he took the cup and believe me friends it was a big day so let me give you a quick rundown what the cup is the cup is called the cup of the Messiah it was a silver cup it was waiting for generations to be touched. And that cup was the sign that the Messiah has arrived. If you had any questions in this room about whether Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the cup is the answer. That's a poor hand. I'll say it one more time. If you weren't sure that it was Jesus who was the salvation of the world and it wasn't Buddha and Muhammad and Confucius and Baha'u'llah and believe me Mahali, Haley Selassie he never drank no cup you got to give God some praise he's the only one that touched that silver cup and drank from it and gave us the drink from it and he deserves all the praise Miles Morogan praise you thank you oh hallelujah I can sleep tonight with my pillow on my head and say, God, you didn't.
quit. You said not my will, but thine be done. You drank that cup. You took it. You picked it up. And you used it. You are the Messiah. Give the Messiah a big praise today. I thought I'd just let you see this in case you think I'm joking around this. Read out loud, Exodus 26, 18. Read, go. Make 20 frames, come on, read. Make 20 frames for the south side of the tabernacle and make 40 silver bases to go under them, two bases for each frame, one under each projection. Now, this is talking about building the holy tabernacle. Do you know that the holy tabernacle never touched the ground? Between the tabernacle and the dirt was silver basis. Do you know what that means? The only way God could touch earth, there has to be redemption in the middle. Notice how specific God is. Because I want silver. I don't want wood. I don't want gold. I don't want plastic. I want silver because I don't touch earth unless there's blood. You better thank God for the blood of Jesus one more time. Yabushata kambrosotela lebrosotere mokundre motika Oh, listen to me. What he's telling you is the only reason why I could come back and live in you your dirt body is because between me and your dirt body is somebody's blood. You ought to give him praise one more time and shout loud, hallelujah. Thank you for the blood. The Holy Ghost is only in you because of the blood. Hallelujah. Read the next verse, Exodus 26, 24. Read. So there will be eight frames and 16 silver bases, two under each frame. I don't want to touch the ground, he says. Read Exodus 38, 26, read. 100 talents of silver were used to cast the bases of the sun. I mean, specifics, silver. Now read this one. So Moses collected the redemption money from those who exceeded the number redeemed by the Levites. From the firstborn of the Israelites, he collected what? Silver weighing 1,365 shekels, according to the sanctuary shekel. And Moses gave the redemption money to Aaron and his sons as he commanded by the word of the Lord. Everything was silver when it comes. Look, look at the word redemption and silver. Redemption and silver. That's why Jesus had to take the silver cup. Hallelujah. Nothing is by mistake. Read Numbers 18. Read verse 16. When they are a month old, you must redeem them at the redemption price set at five shekels of silver. You can do your own study. Everything in redemption is silver. Thank you for the cup, Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. Read Mark. Matthew 26, read. What are you willing to give me if I hand them over to you? So they counted out for him 30 silver coins. From then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand them over. Judas got redemption money. During those days, you never paid people in silver. You paid them in a denarius. Denarius was copper. They didn't give Judas copper. God made them give him redemption money. Finally, read Matthew 27, 6. Read. The chief priest picked up the coins and said, It is against the law to put this into the treasury since it is what? Blood money. Stop right there. Give God a praise. Come on. Judas threw the money on the ground. The chief picked it up and says, we can't even use it. It's blood money. Uh. 
Read the next verse. So they decided to use the money to buy Potter's Field as a burial ground for foreigners. That is why it is being called the Field of Blood to this day. Then what was spoken of Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. They took the 30 silver coins, the price set on him by the people of Israel, and they used them to buy the Potter's Field as the Lord. I mean, if you don't believe that Jesus is Lord, just read the fulfillment of prophecy. blood of Jesus just want to tell you what you're going to eat tonight bread wheat is a seed principle the bread that they use for 4,000 years was from wheat without yeast they crushed it they mixed it with water which is the word and they kept yeast out of it no sin and then they put it in fire Tried by fire. Bread demands what? Breaking and crushing. You gotta crush the wheat. This is my body. They're gonna crush me. And now we get to remember. He goes to the cross, they whip him until they couldn't recognize him. They put nails in his wrist, not his hands, his wrist. They put nails in his ankle, not his top of his feet. Because the weight of your body cannot handle your palm. If you put a nail in my palm and nail it to a cross, when the weight of my body hits my hand, it would rip through my bone and I'd fall off the cross. So they always put the nail between the two bones in the wrist. So when you see the paintings with the nail in the hand, wrong painting. They put the nail on the side between the two bones in your leg, not on the top. Because if you were to put the nails on the top of the feet, when the prisoner would be weight on the top of the feet, the nails would rip through the ligaments in the, in the feet. I'm sure you've seen the, the skeleton of a human's feet. It would rip out all those ligaments. So they put the nails on the side. And here's the way they crucified people. They put one foot on this side of the tree, one on this side, a tree in the middle, and they nailed the nails in the side of the tree. Then they put the nails in the wrist, and they would hang the piece of wood on the tree. Then they would nail your feet. Now they would nail your feet in such a position the Romans were experts at capital punishment. It was the worst in history. It still is. No one is crucified today because of that. The Romans were the worst. And they would bend the knees of the prisoner in such a way that they would... I wish I had a lapel. They, they, would, they would bend the knees so that the prisoner would have to crouch down and his, his wrist would be against knocked into the nails of the wood and he would be with his knees bent now if you try to sit like this for about three minutes you'll die because the pain here would kill you so what the prisoner would do is he would push up to rest when he pushes up to rest all the weight is on the nails in the ankle so the pain shoots through the body and what he does is he realizes I can't remain standing because I die from pain. So he collapses again to rest his knees and his hand then pulls out and it stretches the shoulders. He would push up again to rest and then the pain would kill his knees and he would bend again and this went on for days. The Romans did not crucify you to kill you. They crucified you to pull every bone out of joint. Do you know history will prove this? You go check it out in, on the internet. When a person was crucified successfully and they took them down, all their bones out of joint. It was like a sack of bones. 
because every ligament was torn. The test was ripped out. Every single vertebrae was ripped out. The shoulders were ripped out. The neck was ripped out. The knees were ripped out. Everything. The body was just one limp, disjointed mess. And they would dump them in the garbage heap. The objective of crucifixion was not to kill the prisoner. It was to dismember him. And now it makes sense. The two prisoners who were with him, they knew about British crucifixion. They were probably on death row for a while. And Rome decided to crucify them at the same time. And by the way, in those days, you could drive on the main streets of Rome and you could have a thousand people on the cross at the same time. Did you know that? This story about a green hill far away doesn't exist. It's not scriptural. There would be thousands of people on the cross. The Romans were experts. They did it all. Every day they killed people on the cross. You could actually, the reason why they displayed them on the, wreath, on the streets is because they were sending a message to the people. Behave yourself or this is you. That's why people wagged their heads at him and they spat on him because they did it to everybody else. You walk, go into, go into the market, you see all these people say, good for you, that's good for you, uh-huh, I wish you, that'll hold you. In other words, they would cheer at the people in all their pain blood, bones ripping out through the skin. So these two prisoners knew that they were about to be dismembered. And they also knew that Jesus would be dismembered. So the one on the right said to Jesus, you didn't do anything, hey? You're not guilty. I wonder why are you here with us? He said, I am a wicked man. I deserve this, he said, but not you. You heal people. You help the poor. You cleanse the leper. He said, Jesus, read it. Lord, When he said, remember me, he wasn't talking about reminding you to not forget. He was telling him, when they dismember me, you re-remember me. Put me back together. Anybody being dismembered by life? You feel like life has beaten you so bad that ain't no joints left in place? You can lift your hands today and say the same thing. Re! Oh, somebody shout hallelujah. Say re! Remember my marriage. Remember my finances. Remember my body. Remember my children. Remember my investments. Remember our country, Lord. Put our lives back together. Give him a praise. Oh, hallelujah. He said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And I love what Jesus said. Jesus said, verily I say unto you, I ain't going to remember you after this is all over. I'm going to remember you now. Come on, give God a praise. He says, today, somebody scream hallelujah. Hey, he said, today, I'm going to put you back together. Give God a praise for he put you back together tonight. God's going to fix you tonight. That's my faith. He's going to put us back. The reason why he was on the cross was to remember you. That's why we fast for him. He deserves every day you didn't eat. Just thank him right now. Give him praise. You got to think about what he did for us. And so.
so. Tonight, as we come to this table, he has the biggest story of all. He said, every time you come together, oh, glory, hallelujah. You didn't hear what I said. He said, look, I broke myself up and gave it to all of y'all. He said, when you come together, you still ain't got it. He said, y'all are all over the place, pieces all over the place. But when you sit at the table like this and you get together, the body of Christ is together, you remember. Come on, somebody give him praise. Tonight, we are about to put him back together on this table you are eating at right now. You're going to put, hey, he gonna put, you're going to put him back together. Every time you do this, he says, you remember me. Thank you once again for listening to this message as we hope that it has been a blessing to you. Our goal is to show you new paths and opportunities so that you can discover your purpose. It is your love, support, and partnership that makes Monroe Global possible. Please visit us online at www.monroeglobal.com for more product, partnership, or to join us at one of our live events around the world.